and then actually went into my lungs and went into the one tumor that's a little bit bigger in my lung and burrowed into it. And I could see it everywhere. And it was like amorphous, weird, white. And I just felt sad. Like, I just was like, what happened here? Like, how did I get so off the rails that allowed cancer to grow like this? This is my, I'm, to be honest, like a little nervous because it's the first time interviewing anybody in this fashion before, but I did feel like a, a calling to do this with you and tell your story. And I'm really honored and grateful that uh, you're having me here and we could talk about your story. I am likewise yeah. honored and grateful. <laughs> so yeah, it's, it's, um, feels like it's worth telling just going through it all. <laughs> yeah. It's like, yeah, I'm really glad to be able to get it out and just share everything and anything and whatever to be yeah. able to help. Yeah. And we can like, Edit stuff out if like you fumble or something's like awkward. Yeah. So hopefully be a uh, couple fumbles. But that's okay. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> um, okay. Audio is going good on both tracks and everything. Yeah, we're looking good. Okay, sweet. Um, well, how are you feeling? So actually feeling like awesome, which yeah. is weird to say, like being thirty two or thirty three rounds of um, low dose chemo. Mm like this almost a year of treatments, but I feel better every week, which is crazy. Like I've been doing um, 10 mile hikes up the mountain every week, yeah. uh, high intensity interval classes, like my workouts keep getting better. So all these are just good signs to me. It's just like, okay, my body, like I am a healthy yeah. human being who is just dealing with some cells. And um, also the fact that I am feeling good and my wind is good and everything that uh, uh -huh. the treatments that I'm doing are, hopefully working so so when were you diagnosed with the cancer and what kind of cancer is it so uh last september um september 19th i was diagnosed with colon cancer oh wow almost uh, a year ago yeah just shy of a year so yeah. um and i had had testicular cancer just about 20 years ago in 2004 mm -hmm. so i had stage four testicular cancer and went through just shy of a year of treatments uh, for that and was in remission yeah. for 19 years, you know, in my mind, cancer free this whole time, but um, yeah. unbeknownst to me, I actually had a second cancer, which is fairly common with testicular cancer. Mm -hmm. um, the chemo is like a pretty rough chemo. It's a group of chemos that are some of the most toxic of all the types of chemo for cancer, but it does work. Mm -hmm. So it did save my life, but um yeah, usually it's leukemia or lymphoma as a second cancer, but for me it was colon cancer, and there could be a million reasons, including spiritual or emotional or um, diet, though my diet had gotten a lot healthier in the last eight years. But um, yeah, so it was a bit of a shock for yeah. sure. Okay. Um, you know what? I kind of changed my mind because like, I have this like profile shot of yeah. me, so I think I want it to be more... like. Face on, yeah. Face on, yeah. So is this colon cancer related to the testicular cancer? Um, so not directly by anybody. Like, there's no way to actually know that. But um, the assumption is just like, oh, I had exposure to all these crazy toxic, you yeah. know, DNA damaging chemotherapy in the past. Mm -hmm. So it left me open and susceptible to secondary cancers. I see. Um, just by the damaged DNA and mitochondrial. Yeah. I see. So I'm a total noob when it comes to cancer. I don't know a thing about cancer, honestly. But part of the reason why I wanted to do this is because I feel like every other year I know somebody who gets cancer. Yeah. And they've all dealt with it in different ways, which I think is fascinating um, how they face this really difficult struggle. I guess, like, what is some difficulties that you're facing now, like right now in your current stage? Um, well, I am dealing with um, metastases. So it basically it had spread. I think the picture is that it spread microscopically to my lungs mm -hmm. um, somewhere before surgery or after surgery. Um, and I had started chemotherapy but doing a different chemotherapy than the standard of care full dose. Um, I, I chose an alternate route with that, but um, 
yeah, the lung nodules, it took us six months to figure out, are those actually cancer? You know, they are growing slightly. Okay, we got a biopsy. Yeah, It's colon cancer spread, um, which would have been, yeah, like really bad news yeah. a few years ago, but there's so many different treatments out there right now. Mm-hmm. Um and that I don't have it spread to my liver, like all like I'm in this weird kind of it's like good and bad, and I have a mutation that's called BRAF that used to be very very bad. <laughs> so so when did you learn that it spread to your lungs? So we saw it in March, and then it was confirmed in June, okay. and then I had a biopsy in July. Um, okay, so you were diagnosed with colon cancer, and then a f- several months later, you learned that it spread to your lungs. But you were saying before it could have already been in your lungs from before, yeah, just but may have not so it. small to not I see. see it. And uh, the chemo just doesn't really get into the lungs. And also colon cancer, chemo just doesn't do a great job with colon cancer, unfortunately. Okay. Like I know people that did three years of chemo, not one effect on their whole situation. Yeah. Um, but they're making a ton of breakthroughs in immunotherapy and also what I'm doing, which is called targeted therapy. Uh-huh. So that BRAF mutation that used to be this really bad thing actually is now the key to my like being cured or having that potential to be cured uh-huh. is um, through the targeted therapy. So these medications that basically go after that specific mutation and suppress these proteins and basically take it down yeah. but it takes time so i just started that as soon as we knew that the lungs weren't just nodules because you can just get nodules mm-hmm. um even covid like anything can cause nodules so okay we had to make sure that you know are these nodules continually growing okay yes they are so i started the target therapy like that night as soon as i got that news from the ct scan so I had it waiting in the wings, kind of ready to go. Mm. Um, so, yeah, so I started that from June until my next scan is in a few weeks. So we'll be basically mapping like, okay, to have, you know, realistically what our best expectation is that there was no growth. Mm-hmm. So that would be a win because it will take time to basically tackle it. Um, but I've been speaking to other doctors. I'm looking at... Um, Williams Cancer Institute. Um, they treat in Mexico, but he's got offices in Beverly and Florida. And yeah, he does amazing stuff with uh, intral tumor uh, immunotherapy. So I had a consult with him and I'm getting like other treatment things kind yeah. of like ready should I need to pursue other paths. So, but otherwise, I'm in a good position where I feel great. I have my energy. I have. You know, like the amount of stuff I do every day is like way more than it was when before. Like yeah. I was doing treatments, like I'm driving to Irvine four days a week and doing all this. You know, like I have a very busy, full yeah. life that's a high energy. You know, and I take time to do qigong or do um, yoga nidra and relax as well. But like for the most part, it's a very uh-huh. active routine right now and I feel great like I would never know that I have anything going on mm-hmm. um, you don't feel any physical anything like the this whole thing is pushing my spirit to this like warrior like every week like the fear because there is a lot of fear like yeah. you know you look at statistics and even if there's a small percent to me I say okay well if there's a percent I can do this like it's same with the music industry like there was really, really tiny percent chance that I could, like, you know, make a career in the music industry. And somehow I managed that. <laughs> so You I just, mean like as a teenager? Well, just like looking at, you know, percentages of failure and success. Like okay. there was like a 1% chance yeah. that I could pull that off. Mm-hmm. And somehow I did. So I kind of look at cancer as the same thing. I was like, even if there's a 1% chance, mm-hmm. like I'm going to do everything and the kitchen sink to make sure that I do it with perseverance and dedication and discipline and getting up every day, like just trying to have the best attitude, trying to have uh, an attitude of that. I will live like that. This won't be the end of me. Yeah. And that I actually have a a mission with this and I'm supposed to help people. And I already, all those things are happening. Yeah. So, Uh, so where you are, where are you now in terms of, um, like, is the treatment working? Do you have any stats on, like, or measurements on 
what your status is right now? So we'll know on the next scan, which is okay. the end of September. So basically every three months do a CT scan and you kind of see like three months. Okay. Yeah. Like, all right, like, are we, do we need to pivot? Do we, are we on track? Yeah. Um, and these things like it's very common for this to take years, you know, yeah. like to, for me, I'm realistically looking at doing treatments for the next five years, like, wow maybe two years full time, hopefully I can get out of it in time to trim it back. But even trimming it back will still be maintenance of the yeah. high dose vitamin C and like the IPT chemo will continue even after yeah. if I can get to NED, then it continues, the fight continues. So wow. it's a long uh, process, but I'll know the next checkpoint is if the targeted therapy is working, which is you know what we're hanging our hat on. And I started a couple other therapies this summer too. Yeah. Um, yeah, so then we just pivot and then we started looking at other things. Like there's other clinical trials. Yeah. Um, there's also like trained lymphocyte where they take your lymph cells and they train them to go after the exact like um, mm -hmm. genetic profile of your cancer. And then they unleash your lymphocytes back in your body. We're like on the, right now is like, the most amazing time and will be in the next five to 10 years even more, but amazing time for cancer mm -hmm. treatments. And we have the cures, like according to doctors that I've talked to, all the cures are here. It's just getting the right combination of things and each patient is different. Uh -huh. So I'm hopeful just like I might be chasing my tail with this for a little bit, but we'll get it. Yeah. We'll get it handled. Yeah. So you're, you're treating or first I want to ask is, um, you, you said before, like, your testicular cancer is still kind of in remission. Yeah, so that's technically, I'm cured of testicular cancer. You are cancer. cured. Okay, so um, I, want, I wonder if this affects that at all. It doesn't, it's never good to have more exposure to chemo yeah. and more things. That's why I chose a different path with this, with not doing full-dose chemo, because um, I just went with my heart on that. Like, I just felt like, because once you do full dose chemo and it doesn't work and then that's done that option's done your immune system is also just cooked like mm -hmm. you don't have an immune system left so yeah. um the ipt chemo has had great results it's not perfect neither is regular chemo mm -hmm. but it's 15 percent the dose of normal chemo so i can do that for a long long time and then i do chelation so things that would clear those metals out of the blood and um, the high dose vitamin C and all these supplements that bolster the immune system yeah. so that the effects of this treatment won't, you know, bring cancer back in a different way. Mm -hmm. But it is possible. And actually, there's no proof of this, but it's a possibility that um, cancer stem cells, so basically the stem cell that was the testicular cancer, because stem cells are interchangeable and can be, you know, programmed to be anything. Basically, they're like the root cell mm. that that just basically laid dormant as a cancer stem cell and then said, hey, now I'm a colon cancer cell. Mm. So like the stem cell never got cleared out, but the testicular cells did. Is that normal? So, well, that's the thing with cancer. I think they're, we're finding, yeah, like mm. you have to get the stem cells and that chemo doesn't get the stem cells. I so the other therapies are required. But is that a new discovery or, uh, it's or could new, they address new that? New to me, I'm sure like yeah. others, you know, it was not talked about at when all you had, 20 years ago. For yeah, me. when you had testicular cancer. Yeah. yeah, and the place where I'm at in Irvine focuses a lot more on that than I think the maybe general standard of care uh, hospitals maybe. So yeah, let me. can you tell me like how is your treatment different now than before i know you had some trouble with some doctors um you know i, I want to talk about like positive thinking as well yeah. and how how doctors have been treating you um and how big of a role that has played in in you dealing with all of this yeah i mean that's been a crazy thing to navigate because i basically said no i'm not gonna go do you know like standard of care chemo yeah. And I'm going to go to this holistic clinic and do still chemo, but um, it's called IPT, which is insulated, insulin uh, potentiated targeted chemo. So they use insulin 
to drop your blood sugar and basically cancer cells are hungry for glucose Mm -hmm. and then you pump the chemo in and then get the blood sugar back up and they feed on the chemo and it basically it has better results with less uh, damage to the body Uh um but yeah it's not perfect but it is pretty amazing and what i've seen there at the clinic has been amazing but i had to basically go on a leap of faith and trust my heart that I was making the best decision for my specific case. Mm -hmm. I love the people there. I love my team there. Mm -hmm. So thankful for that path and everything I've learned there. Um, I still do have to deal with, like I'm still with City of Hope and um, uh, Providence St. John too. And I'm doing the targeted therapy with them. So I'm kind of like using whoever, like, and all of us are collaborating, but it's hard to find people that are willing to do that. Yeah. So Cedars, like, you know, they didn't want to do it's that. Like and our way or the highway. With yeah. Them. And it's like, I can see a big machine like that and somebody's got to hang their hat at the end of the day on your results. So like mm-hmm. liabilities, but um, everybody that I found has been cool with me doing this thing here and like everybody team working it together. And I kind of look at it like the Cedars doctor said, well, you don't have a leader. And I said, well, that's actually, I'm the leader. Like I'm the CEO, like my body's my company. Yeah. It's up to me. Like if I fail, then my, you know, like I die. So yeah. I'm not going to be like um, looking to an authority. Like I'm going to participate in this and go to experts and hear everybody out and decide like a CEO would, yeah. you know, what to do for his company. Sure. So as opposed to when you had testicular cancer 20 years ago, that was like under. Yeah, just that was one hospital. That was, and I was essentially a kid at that time, you know, like I didn't know anything about anything mm-hmm. about anything. So like I was just in a band. I think most people are like that. Yeah, like, and so I just basically went back and lived with my parents and they took, you know, my dad like took off work and took me to chemo and I was a kid more in that role. Mm-hmm. Um, Though I did learn and I did get engaged and stuff with it, it was still just like one hospital, you know, bam, chemo, bam, surgery, bam, chemo. And it was like yeah, all just kind of a pretty f- gnarly, intense, but also fast-ish. It's already longer, the second cancer of treatments than the first cancer was. And I was just done and mm-hmm. cured, essentially. So. so from our conversations that we've had before, I kind of... And correct me if I'm if I'm wrong if I have the right impression because I don't know anything about cancer but everybody it seems to be very common. Um, it seems like there's like these therapies, chemo that work that are tried and true that induce a lot of suffering, but they work. Yeah. But there's all these other options that maybe have less suffering but maybe some doctors here and there aren't so familiar with because they're just attached to what works. Yeah. And so maybe the treatment out there in some shape or form is outdated uh, or maybe doctors aren't keeping up to date with the newest research. Like, can you talk about like what your yeah, experience no, has been like with that? That's a huge thing. Um, massive, massive thing um, that I'm finding too. But talking with different doctors, like talking to my targeted therapy oncologist Mm -hmm. they're saying this is the future we're moving away from chemo but they're kind of like cutting edge and they're like trailblazing way beyond where other institutions and these things are you know it's you're talking about behemoth hospitals and machines and the pharmaceutical industry like all this mass it's just these things are so huge yeah so they don't uh change and jump around overnight Um, But then you have independent guys like this Williams Cancer Institute who just started going in and doing stuff in Mexico, where in Mexico, they, you know, they don't have the FDA. They say, whatever you can do to get people to live, they have a very pro, like, they want everyone to live. So whatever you need to do, just do it. And we give you like carte blanche. So in Mexico, he's doing all these immunotherapies. He's injecting into tumors directly with immunotherapy. Uh having insane cure rates like what i mean blowing the rest of the system out of the water but the whole thing with clinical trials and you know it's a beast as far as like okay let's go from mice to humans only 10 percent of what 
from mice to humans works yeah. and then the money that's involved oh we need 25 million so he actually got clinical trials going uh -huh. because he has human data because he's just been doing it so that's kind of where the future is and he i had a long conversation with him last week and really hopeful and but also frustrating about like where the united states medical industry is at and it's yeah. something for me like i'm having to navigate away from these big you know conglomerates and then find these you know and there are doctors that are doing these amazing work so there are tapped into this mm -hmm. where the future of oncology is going and then there's some things that are just a big machine and like you know like i've had a ton of conversations with people at our cancer center from people all over the united states that are flying to irvine mm -hmm. to do treatment because their treatment failed them in kansas or pennsylvania or chicago or wherever wow. all over the country they're flying to this holistic clinic as like a last shot type thing um but it's interesting to hear their experience with their doctors are like nobody looked for gene mutations there wasn't any talk of immunotherapy or like where immunotherapy and targeted therapy really are probably the most cutting edge. Mm -hmm. Then you also have metabolic therapy and like, um, blanking on the guy's name right now, but, um, yeah, he has a whole thing going too. Like, so there's all these people that are getting really great results, but how do you implement it into the greater, mm -hmm. you know, pharmaceutical industry? It's, it's tough. It's a beast. Basically. Yeah. I can't imagine all the bureaucracy and red tape and money and all sorts of things that go into our healthcare industry. Yeah. I mean, it's literally, we're losing lives because of it, but it, like how the answer is not clean and simple, but for me navigating it, I just go, okay, if I need to go to Mexico, I'll go to Mexico. Like yeah. if I need to go to Irvine and not, you know, go to my local city of hope or whatever, I'll go do what I need to do to to do what I feel is right mm -hmm. as far as the information presented to me and also looking at the logic, you know, there's every, all the doctors have different opinions. So it's like, they aren't all right and they aren't all wrong either. So you have to sort of like, so how do you make that decision on what to do? If, if you have all these different opinions, do you have any doubts that the path that you're going down might not work or I'm sure, or do any of the doctors disagree? Like, um, so I definitely, yeah, like it was, oh my God, am I, am I doing the right thing? Mm -hmm. You know, basically doing the IPT versus full dose chemo. But my, like I said, my heart just said, after my chemo experience in the past, I wouldn't wish that experience on my worst enemy. I wouldn't wish that on Hitler. Like I wouldn't wish full dose chemo on any living creature. Like it's, the worst and they're, they're like oh it's not that bad now it's like you're talking to a guy who just got like blasted with the three most toxic you know drugs mm. no thanks like i'm good um and also knowing that colon cancer it doesn't like with testicular cancer that chemo does work that's the thing where it's like it does work like even now the cancer center i'm at they wouldn't recommend to ipt for testicular like mm you kind of got to go do what works for colon though. It's not really like full dose <laughs> doesn't really work. Like okay. it can, but it has a pretty abysmal like success rate. So mm -hmm. to my going out and talking to, you know, investigating around and I talked to the people at Irvine, have you had success? Have you put people in remission? The doctor, they're doing it for 20 years. Yes. Many, many, many people. And is he up on all the latest things? Is he adventurous and willing to like connect me with a guy in Mexico or is he just going to stick to the standard of care, which mm -hmm. is big and maybe dumb in some ways, but maybe also, you know, like not to dismiss, like there's a lot of money in clinical trials and like mm -hmm. it is, there's reasons that they do the things they do. Um, and there are certain cancers that really you can't do anything outside of what they're doing, you know, mm -hmm. other than the things you do at home with diet and you know lifestyle but but for yeah i felt like for my path there were other options and even those options now like i'm in the midst of them and there's still other things to try in the wings should sure. i need to you know how many doctors do you have let's see <laughs> <laughs> uh 
I think I whittled it down to like four. Okay, main ones. Right That's now. less than I thought. Yeah. actually, from what is from what it, you make it sound. I've had I've there are many other people involved, including like the surgeon and like you yeah. know, the gastro guy and like. But as far as like the main okay. team, yeah, I'd say really one main guy in Irvine, and then uh, my Providence uh-huh. with tar- targeted therapy. So what does full-on chemo feel like? To me, yeah. I mean, I, back then I lost every hair on my body. Like I didn't even have eyebrows or eyelashes. Like it looked like um, powder or something. Yeah, that, like stereotypically what somebody with cancer looks like. Yeah, like and that's... Which is, is not that is what more, you look like now at all. Yeah, like that's, yeah, the difference of the dosing. Like that, at that dose, that's when you lose all your mm. your immune cells, your like your stomach lining... Uh, for me, it was like throwing up all day, every day, yeah. uh, nausea. That's like a deep, like it was so bad at the end that they basically had to put me in like a semi-coma state for my last cycle of chemo. Wow. And I just was in the hospital for a week and a half while they were giving to me. And I don't remember anything. I wow. just was out for that because I was like, I would throw up so much and like down to the bile. Yeah. And then just like no life force totally felt like a a candle with its you know flame down to it barely yeah. hanging on kind of thing and how long did that last for that was eight months that i was in that and then and with a surgery in between too that was also very intense <laughs> yeah so, you lost one of your one of your balls i right? did i don't even know what it's called is it scrotum or something or? uh testicle it's a testicle yeah I lost, I'm yeah, an I idiot. Lost but like, yeah. <laughs> um, I'm I'm a little blunt in some ways, but I hope you could appreciate it, or just let me know if I'm. Oh no, I make, I'm the first to make jokes about it. I call it one ball perks. Okay, like, <laughs> all types of yeah. Because if you can't make jokes about it, then yeah, it can just be sad or just like yeah. a bummer, you know. But yeah. if you can laugh about it at the end of the day, yeah. He who laughs last. Yeah. Well, and as a musician also, I, I, and me as a musician in, in my past, I've always felt like if you could create beauty or in this case, laughter about anything that you're going through, it just like, in a way, it kind of like makes it, I don't want to say it makes it worth it because like nobody wants to go through that, but putting an expression to it to share with others, like there's just something very valuable yeah. about expressing expressing yourself. I think that's kind of my core, you know, operating system with all of this is, is you have to go through it anyway. So you can go through it. And I, I, there are stages obviously like anger, fear, um, all those things. And I did have those stages with the second cancer, but either way, you got to go through it. So you can make it this awesome epic tale or you can let it crush you and, make you sad and just, or let it kill you, you know, or you can warrior up, make, you know, like I go to the cancer center. I'm usually laughing the whole time. I'm Mm -hmm. always cheery and doing a dance and not like, I'm not trying to do that. I'm just like happy to be with those people. Mm -hmm. Those people have become family. There's a piano there. I go and play piano. Like I I make it a fun day and I leave very positive and like charged up. Yeah. with like good energy like I, it's even though there there's people suffering and there's there's a lot going on there but mm. still walk around with this big a you know like like my day is good every day like and i to turn that to have this whole situation actually have my life be better than it was you know before i was diagnosed is kind of crazy like mm. to think of like wow everything even though yes there are these things I'm dealing with and yes, it's still scary and yes, it's a pain in the ass and all of that. It's still, my life is like better right now than yeah. it was a year Before ago. You had yeah. How do you feel it's better? Just it's filled with positive mission. Like yeah. I am helping a lot of people at the cancer center and that feels good. Yeah. Um, new How- friends. I was just kind of like in this studio before too, just by myself and like frustrated with the world or whatever and like just in a weird stuck thing and i feel just like busted out yeah. and also you know just the reminder of like hey there's no guarantees like am i gonna live in just a, a year or two or three like is that what i'm looking at here or like uh, 
do I have a life? I don't know. And I guess none of us really know. There's no guarantees. But to have that reminder every day definitely also makes you like, how am I going to feel awesome today? Like, let's hike further. Let's run more. Let's like, yeah. you know, do more push ups. Let's do ice baths. Like, let's just always step up, you know? Yeah. Yeah. I think that not holding on to like just only having what we have today, like, that's that's a good spot to be in. Yeah. And there's a lot of things to be happy about yeah. moment to moment throughout the day. Okay. So let's talk about, um, your first cancer and but i want to talk about your music stuff and a bunch of other stuff but um i guess the first thing that came to mind was uh was your first cancer um do you what was like do you remember like what the statistic was or how dire it was or or were you set to survive um so it was dire in that it was spread everywhere so it was in my lungs again yeah. then um but my kidney was about to like burst off because it had twisted 180 degrees around and it was choking my aorta under my heart wow. um so in that sense it was dire and i remember everybody was freaking out basically as soon as i got i went to the er yeah. down in la and we were recording our album um, my band and yeah i was in pain and like sick and weird feeling for a long time for like months but then really bad the last three weeks and just finally got dropped at the ER. I had really bad back pain for my kidney. Mm -hmm. um, so my parents picked me up that night at like 2 a.m., drove me back to Sacramento, and I was in doctor's visits like immediately after that. Everybody was very panicked, and like it was a very urgent situation. But um, I think the survivability was – actually, it was never really talked about, which is interesting, but – um, my mom worked at UC Davis too, so she knew testicular is pretty good survivability rate mm -hmm. with, but you just have to go through that chemo. So I guess they, some, some doctors may not want to tell you like the survivability rate. Yeah. I mean, for me, I'd rather not know, like, yeah, I don't like I had the, cause it's just like a number. It's just a statistic. Yeah. And it's know? a little bit of doom casting, I yeah. feel like, because, um, if you, are told that there's no hope you're going to die. I think most people will just kind of like hear that and say, okay, I'm going to die. And maybe that's true. Like maybe there are sometimes cases where it, it is true, but then there's also tons of cases where they're told they're going to die and then they go and pull some miraculous shit off because they're badass or they just got lucky or something yeah. happened there or prayer or miracle or whatever there, but those people that, that exists. Like, mm -hmm. and the fact that it does exist means it's possible. So for me, like I, until the very last breath will hold on to every possibility and hope yeah. um, that there is a solution, that there's something I can do every day, you know? And it sounds like there's tons of things you could do. I mean, there really is. And there's like probably, I think every week, something new, yeah. including just the things at home and the, you know, there's tons of stories of fasting, you know, the ice bath situation is a whole thing too. Mm -hmm. um, and for me, that's all supplemental. Like I wouldn't hang my hat on it, but if you can do all that at home and, you know, take the right supplements, exercise the high intensity intervals, like that's shown to really like stop, if not fight cancer, yeah. ice baths, you know, for me, when I do my 10 mile hikes, I just, I'm dripping sweat and I'm huffing so much air that I feel like that stress in my lungs, like I love it, but the cancer cells just must not like that at all. Yeah. So whatever I can do every day and I don't want to know, like, I don't want to be told it's dire. Yeah. Even if it is. <laughs> so. so, um, so your first round of cancer, testicular cancer lasted about eight months before you were in remission? Yeah, I would say it was eight months of, and then it felt like about a year though, where it was like, okay, done with everything with like scans and, yeah. you know, the really regular routine stuff, but. Okay. So you were in a band and from what I understand, like pretty successful or on your way to being pretty successful. I think, yeah, we were like, had the potential, we, we had some cool things happening. Yeah. Um, like what? So Mike Shinoda of Lincoln Park had been had 
are we a uh, buddy of ours in the band dropped a CD off to him and got a whole dialogue going and we ended up being like the first band on their label. Oh, wow. um, they bought us pro tools and gear to like wow. do all these, you know, tracking Just... demos and they would come to band practice and we had like song lessons and studio time with Mike and we were basically developing our songwriting um, yeah. to make an album and go do the thing. Um, and we were in the process of making the album with Danny Lohner, um, who was in Nine Inch Nails and Perfect Circle and really cool, one of our favorite producers. And um, that was right when I was diagnosed was like three weeks into starting the album at his house down here in LA. So. Wow. So did what happened with that band? It had to... Uh, just, yeah, like there were some interesting personalities and just a lot of... Yeah. So they tried to go on without you or were you still able to be in it somehow? No, I, we stayed, I stayed in the band for the first year of going through cancer and everything. But yeah. then, um, yeah, it just kind of hit me that it wasn't the right situation okay. for me somewhere about a year. Did it have to do with the cancer or was it like some band issues? Both. I think cancer kind of gave me this like new glimpse at life and new... I just felt like I was tapped into something, this little voice in me or this little like guide that was like, okay, now this way, yeah. now you're set to go this path. Um, also, like I built a studio and started recording bands and then it was in another band that I felt kind of drawn to those guys to, yeah, so there was a musical journey happening. Yeah. Um, and I just felt like, yeah, I needed to part ways. Did you have any like near-death experiences yeah, there's definitely been a lot of, I've had, I would say, like, paranormal things. Okay. Um, far and few between, but they've been there. But I think the overall, like, being tapped into kind of having, like, one foot on the other side or a pinky toe maybe on the other side yeah. since the first cancer. Um, I was there with people when they passed away. You know, like, I was volunteering at the hospital at UC Davis. Uh -huh. When you were a teenager? Um, after my first cancer. Yeah, I was 22. Okay. I was going through that. But um, for a year after that, I volunteered and met with tons of cancer patients and was there with one of them when he passed away. And um, some of the ones that I got to know were passing away. And just there was a lot of, like, weird things going on with death and the other side and... Um, yeah, I've had a, like a lot of weird. Like, well, yeah, can you have... talk about some of these paranormal uh, experiences or? Yeah, I mean, um, well, one was my neighbor who passed away from cancer. Um, I was there with him when he passed, and a year to the day that he passed, he came to me in a dream and told me what it was like his passing, and basically said, you know. It was all dark. He showed me all the darkness and said yeah. the hardest thing was going to a place that no one could hear him. Wow. And I felt him actually leave his body when he passed too. Mm -hmm. And in the dream, I kind of was drawn back to that memory of him leaving and him basically seeing us and not being able to communicate because he was leaving. Yeah. Um, but then he showed me, you know, like colors and like light and nature Mm -hmm. And as the dream was fading, I asked him, is there life after death? And he said, you have to develop it. Hmm. I thought that was interesting. But um, yeah, I don't know. I've had like a singing ghost lady. I've had like a bunch of weird ghost things over, you know, the last, like so many weird spooky little things. But um, always with me, there's been this presence of just guardian angel, um, whatever that is, like whether it's my grandmother that I've never met, my mom's mom. Or I have no idea. I have no idea what anything is. Yeah. Um, and I know I'll never know, but I definitely know that there's something there and I listen to it. Yeah. And I follow it for sure. How do, how do you feel about death? I know that you're fighting very hard and I think it's a worthy fight. Uh, but me personally, I'm like not to be morbid or anything, but I'm a little fascinated by death. I'm curious to know what's on the other side. And I don't think it's the end. I think that it's very beautiful or it or life recycles, like con conservation of energy. It's yeah. like nothing is destroyed or created. It's it changes forms. Yeah. 
Um, I don't personally, I mean, I, I do think life is precious. It's worth fighting for. I think we, we are here for a reason. And, and um, I've been getting into like Jungian philosophy lately. And he explains that consciousness is a very new kind of human development that is still being evolved. I, I kind of feel like that's what we're here for yeah. is to evolve consciousness, whatever that means for whatever reason. Um, but, um, but how, how do you feel about it? Um, well, I definitely don't want to do it yet, <laughs> but I am, I know that I will eventually yeah. be, you know, like it's the one thing that we're all promised. Like, yeah. That's the only thing we're guaranteed in this life is that we will eventually die. But I do, I agree with completely. I think it's beautiful um, and sad too, because you'll only be like, I definitely, my, my heart, if I could take an intuitive stab at what's going on here, it definitely does feel like there is another side. There is some other dimension that are our soul, our consciousness, whatever it is, that is us that's had 80,000 lives or a hundred thousand or a million li lives, you know, that yeah. soul maybe it comes back as a woman and it's a, you know, different race or a different, you know, planet, different solar system. Like who knows what's going on with it, but there's something yeah. where we are. It does feel like recycle. And then we come back and the goal being to keep evolving our soul or consciousness. It does feel like life is like a lesson or a school. Like it yeah. does, you know, all that feels it's like right. you, what your friend was saying is like life after death is there, but you have to develop it. Yeah. Whatever that means. Yeah. And what, how long you're there like what i have no idea you know I, i'm fascinated with like the near-death experience mm -hmm. stories and like the people that come back and their tellings and you know you'll never really know till we experience it ourselves i just know that i only have this life with my family as they are now yeah. with my wife and the cats and this life <laughs> and, and all the music skills i've acquired and like yeah but this this one is only now like and once it's done this one's done and that's fine and there'll be another thing yeah. but like i would like to definitely keep this one for as long as possible yeah and then but then there's all the sadness that goes around somebody passing all the loved ones um you know which shouldn't be discounted at all yeah you know yeah, no, there's a, there's like thinking of like some real pain that people will go through yeah you know that um but there's, do, a, there's a reason for that too you know yeah. there's a reason to protect people from that as well yeah you know i mean our u.s culture i think has made death a little bit of like a uh, like we just you know there isn't as much beauty and maybe reverence around it as you see in other cultures and like the mm -hmm the artistic like way of letting someone go with that much beauty and that much love in the community, um, knowing the soul is going on its journey and it's not the end. Like I, I do wish we embraced more of that mm -hmm. here. Like we just kind of like don't deal with it or don't talk about it or. Um, so speaking of death, I know that you went on an ayahuasca retreat uh, recently and uh, I want to hear all about that. Yeah. Um, yeah, so, okay, so first of all, when, when did you go? Uh, three weekends ago. Yeah. Okay, so very recently, so it's like very fresh. Do you still yeah. feel any type of way from it? Yeah, I'm definitely forever changed. <laughs> okay, wow. Yeah, like massively. Well, yeah, w walk me through like day one, like what, what happened. So, yeah, well, it's interesting as... Um, like my nurse was there, some other cancer survivor and cancer people going through cancer. Oh, wow. So it ended up kind of being a little bit cancer themed, I guess. People you that say. you knew already? Yeah. Um, did they? And one that I didn't know that uh -huh. had also stage four cancer. And did they go because you recommended it to them or just? One of them, but not the other one. Just, I think it just happened to be that way. Wow. Which was interesting. And it played into the first night as far as, um, yeah, like we all got brought up to the center of the room. But um, yeah, like a lot came out, like each night was so different too. And the first night was really, really tough. But it, I 
kind of liken it to being like smashed open with like a sledgehammer mm-hmm. and it cracked some kind of deep shell that was in me. Um, and a lot of it had to do with anger and which is interesting because I don't feel like an angry person, like, but there was definitely like deep in there, like, um, yeah, probably a lifetime of like frustrations, but then, you know, maybe passively suppressed or all these things Mm -hmm. where it's just deep in there. It's just sitting there and there's, you know, spiritually so much link with cancer and anger. Sure. So it was a pretty huge thing to have busted open. That felt like a part of a necessary part of like, Oh, if I'm going to actually heal this, you can throw chemo and this drug and all these, you know, curcumin and all these things at it all day. But if you don't heal the seed yeah. of the, the spiritual part of it, then nothing will really heal. So that definitely <laughs> felt like that was happening the first night. And I, I would say I almost got put on trial is yeah. what it felt like a little bit, but, uh, but it was awesome and it was necessary. And I cried probably harder than I've ever cried that night. Yeah. Um, and it was a weird kind of cry and I didn't feel like um, any of the psychedelic stuff. And I felt like stone cold sober, but the emotional, everything. And there was like stuff, old wounds from teenager, yeah. like um, unworthiness, all these things came out up and out. Yeah. But then totally refreshed the next day and bonded with the family of that group of people and really intensely from that. Then the second night, beautiful singing, dancing. Well, let's let's talk about the first night a yeah. little bit more. I mean, I think that's totally understandable for you to have anger and you like you've gone through so much suffering now and from your childhood. And I'm sure there's been other moments that um most people don't have to go through. Yeah. I never went through any of that. Yeah. You know, so I imagine there's like this why me, this type of, you know, confusion, you know, and, but you overcame every, everything and you're smiling about everything, but yeah, that doesn't necessarily mean it's like healed on the inside. Yeah. I okay, guess just yeah. deep in there or, um, like a lot of it, I think, had to do with like authority, um, you know, the external world, like the seeing the injustices and, you know, the things that we're all mad about, mm-hmm. just getting very frustrated about a lot of stuff that really doesn't have anything to do with me. But also you feel like it's, you know, it's all our planet. It's all our fight. Yeah. I was big into this whole fight for truth and for justice and all this stuff. But um yeah, like, interesting that it actually like shattered. Oh wow! I, uh, that basically is like you don't have anything to do with that anymore. Yeah, and has like broken almost. I would say an addiction to knowing about it and following along with it, the external stuff. So, yeah. um, it just completely like since then I haven't. Yeah. So these injustices that you were attached to, in terms of. Uh, like your advocacy for them or against them. Um, that's something that you held on to for your whole life. I would say in the last 10, 10, 10 15 years. years of like, you know, getting into it and, you know, rabbit holing and all these things yeah. that definitely, yeah, all of it was something that I became it became very clear to me that that all had to go for me to like heal and yeah. that any paying attention to that would just yeah. let the anger keep pooling up or like, you know, and really none of it has anything directly to do with me. So I was like, okay, cool. Yeah. But it took, I had to kind of break the addiction and that just the habit of it, I think mm. um, the frequency. Yeah. I, um, I drove, I do capoeira and uh, it's like a Brazilian martial arts. I drove this kid home. He's not a kid. He's like 28. Uh, Drove him home after class one day last week. And this was my first time spending time with him. I talked to him like a little bit in class here and there. But man, he was like so weird. And he just like had nothing but negative things to say. Wow. Um, he was complaining about his old school in Santa Barbara, about all the people there were, you know, were like immature or they, 
you know, they're in school. Like, what do you expect? Yeah. You know, but the amount of negativity that he was putting on external things that had nothing to do with him was like, um, it was really hard for me to absorb. Like, I felt like I needed to go home and like take a shower. Yeah. After is, speaking yeah. with him, you know, it's like toxic energy. Um, I didn't know how to handle that energy. And I haven't seen that or experienced that for a long time. Um, but maybe, you know, maybe I didn't know him that well. Like, we only had like 15 minutes in the car together. So I don't know where he's coming from. But my, my first impression was just like, man, like, why are you saying, like, why are you um, so mad about all these things yeah. that have nothing to do with you? Yeah. Yeah. It's a slippery slope, too. Because what's interesting is, like, I didn't ever feel mad throughout my day but it you do still feel it like yeah. you can go around smiling and be happy all day but like if you're still uh, about you know yeah this that and the other then you are still that you know yeah. you just might not express it too and if it's if it's toxic in any degree i think it manifests itself in a physical way so i'm glad that you know that's just like another another tool you have now to like fight this cancer. I feel. Yeah, it felt like a huge um, necessary thing to break through. So, and then also it was like the crack of my armor or whatever, my shell got opened up and like some sort of deeper message just got like boom, boom yeah. implanted in there to re-scramble <laughs> yeah. the circuits in the best way. So I forgot to ask like, is it okay for you to do ayahuasca while you're in the middle of treatment? Like, did you talk to this about your, to your yes. doctors about yeah. this? Yeah. Yeah. And we did, um, like I did stop chemo for a couple of weeks before treatment and then mm -hmm. I stopped a uh, certain supplements and then I stopped other medication like two and, days before. And they were all okay with it? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Actually my doctor recommended it. Really? Uh, someone who he had also done it. Yeah. And he's like, for you, I think, I, you know, Basically, he's like having a soul will no longer be like a faith based thing. Like you'll know. Yeah. And I think it's he's like it couldn't be a better time. And actually, it's weird as I joked about this is dark, but I joked a year ago about like oh I would do ayahuasca if I had like a terminal disease or something. Yeah. It's like whoops! I fast forward a year later, like you know, be careful what you joke about. But yeah, kind of lesson. But why? Why do you think now? I mean, I know you're going through cancer and everything, but why haven't you done it before? I don't know. Yeah, I was kind of like intimidated by it or just like yeah. it felt like a lot. But then I've been kind of following like this divine timing thing in my whole life. Mm -hmm. And sometimes I just know like, oh, that's just not yet. But I know it's coming. Mm -hmm. it, a little bit also felt like that where it's like, I know I have a future with it. It's just not now. And then now having this last three night ceremony is very clear why this had to be my first time because it was so epic and so life-changing and so like this missing puzzle piece or this necessary key yeah. to unlock like the door for me yeah. in life so it, it would have been less impactful had i done it sooner so i think i was just listening to my intuition yeah with that but it was definitely like a scary thing too like when i thought about it, it was like oh like even though i saw marcy coming home always felt like she was always improving and elevating every experience she had. There was some sort of healing or thing that was shed mm -hmm. or, um, yeah, I just saw always positive change in her, but it was like, I don't know if I'm ready for that. Cause I was also, it sounded intense. Like everybody that talks about it, it doesn't sound like it's not fun. It's not unicorns and rainbows. And yeah, though the second night was for us. And that was cool to know that there is also, joy and like singing and stuff and actually i had a crazy interdimensional experience on the second night wait okay so for the first night you so how long did it last for you so we were up yeah till i was up till six or seven in the morning oh wow so they, so they started probably pretty late then. yeah like 10 or 11 yeah did you what happens during the day did you like talk about your experience yeah we had like group share okay and then just yeah just everybody kind of hang in and I talking see. which is really awesome too and like so much um wisdom from like everybody sure what is that like so are they because 
in my experience, it was so important to have a guide there. Mm-hmm. I went to Peru and it ended up being just me and the guide, actually. Nobody showed up, yeah, which is crazy, crazy. Yeah. during like the busiest time. But um, man, it was so important to have him there to be able to interpret it what happened to me yeah because like without him like i would have been like i would have no idea like i would have just been freaked out well yeah um so like did you have that or like maybe you got that from talking with people or maybe like the shaman helped you kind of interpret like our really good friend brad who's he plays music through the whole time and he's He's kind of like leading the group energy, I feel like, with his music and just his energy. But he's such a humble, yeah, like in the background guy about it. But his wisdom, yeah, like he was, he was that guy for me. Like cool. um, anything deep to share. So you had that support. Yeah, and he's he was able to see what was going on too. So he had things like it wasn't like I had to even ask him anything. Like he, yeah, had his report already for me which was beautiful oh wow yeah and everybody had something too which was cool yeah what was that music like it was unbelievable like his yeah like i felt called to serve any way i can to help record them and work with them and like do anything because i was just like this is pure magic Yeah. yeah mine was the same way that music i felt it through my body for sure um it drove me uh like because you have to throw up like every time, right? So I actually didn't throw up the whole three nights. Really? Other people threw up. So you just let that stuff in? For me, I would say. Like other people, and they said, I think I threw up for you. And I was like, I'm pretty sure that I knew. Yeah, like I knew that they were throwing up for me. Maybe you needed it in your body to like. I felt like that. I was like, like, I could feel the consciousness of it. Yeah. And it was like, every drop of me needs to be in you. Like. You're not getting it. I was very nauseous and I could have made myself throw, but I didn't have like a, but I also felt like too, it was like, oh, this guy throws up all the time because I do throw up from vitamin C and sometimes from chemo and. You didn't throw up at all. So I didn't throw up from this because maybe she knew to be easy on me because <laughs> like. So it would just come out like through your pee, I guess. Yeah. I mean, I just. So like you're normal, just normal. Yeah. And the nausea did go away after four hours. Yeah. <laughs> That's wild. Like, I can't imagine not throwing up. Everybody around me was throwing up almost instantly. Yeah. Almost the whole night. Yeah. Like, so it was, even that was enough to make you, like, nauseous. But I just didn't. Yeah. That's wild. I I don't, I mean, I don't know that much about ayahuasca, but I just can't imagine. But yeah, like, it it did feel like other people. I liked the taste of it. It You did like the taste. Yeah, I did like the taste. (laughs) And everyone's like, oh, the taste is so bad. And I was like, I really, and there was uh, sprays. Okay. So these sprays that were these floral things that they made um, from where they get the medicine, it, it kind of like linked up mm-hmm. somehow with the, the taste, the smell of that stuff. And it was like interesting okay. smell and taste, but it didn't bother me. Okay. But I definitely felt, yeah, nausea. And I felt other people like literally throwing up for me like and they said that too after which was a trip (laughs) okay so first ceremony was over you didn't have any visuals or anything um maybe a little bit at the end of the night but really not i was just so like it was like mostly in your your (laughs) body yeah Um, okay so our dear friends the makosi foundation who uh, they do a lot of song and a lot of, yeah, music is a huge part of what their tradition. So they started busting into their songs, huh. which were the coolest. How many ever. people? Um, I th- there's like eight, maybe seven, or eight of okay. them. But then the whole group, we just all got in singing and dancing. Oh, um, wow. Dancing too. And then shortly after all that, I had um, like an interdimensional experience. I kind of went back to my mat and went inside myself well when i closed my eyes i saw a seraphim which is like a angel it's not really something that's in my mind very often but i do remember it from wrinkle in time book growing up but um it's a many winged angel with many eyes mm-hmm. and i guess they're like above the archangels or whatever but they're kind of like this amorphous thing with just a bunch of wings 
all coming off of them and eyes everywhere. And when I closed my eyes, I would see that very clearly. And the wings were folding and the eyes were there blinking at me. And then I felt it kind of like come in and like engulf me. And then I was inside my body and I could see my cells and I could see the red blood cells and the white blood cells. And I was just looking at all these cells going, oh my God, these little, all these little individuals, they're all little individual life forms, yet they're me. Like I am all of this, but also they are not me. They're, they're um, themselves, you know, they're their own thing. So was just totally mind blown about that whole yeah. idea. And then actually went into my lungs and went into the one tumor that's a little bit bigger in my lung and burrowed into it. And I could see it everywhere. And it was like amorphous, weird, white. And I just felt sad. Like, I just was like, what happened here? Like, how did I get so off the rails that allowed cancer to grow like this? Um, yeah, I just remember feeling heartbroken for the cancer too. And just like, asked for forgiveness and I also forgave it and there was just like a lot of love and forgiveness for this mm. situation like um, the cancer itself was a living organism yeah. to be respected that needed to be thanked as well for like that came the next morning but it was yeah forgiveness was the biggest thing it was like I forgive you and please forgive me too like I allowed this to happen or I am responsible for this so mm. um but yeah, I started packing to that beat, which that beat was moving in my body really strongly. Like, like there might as well just been, you know, the roots drummer right there playing right behind my head. Like the beat was in me yeah. and we're packing the cancer up. Um, it was me basically packing this into this little, what ended up becoming like a little light seed. And then I knelt in front of God, which was nothing i couldn't see anything but i could feel it and it almost like kneeling in front of a mountain that just goes straight up it felt like that large mm -hmm. but there was nothing too but there was a little bowl there and i basically knelt down and gave god the seed which was me it was my soul it was like the the root of me but it was also the cancer and then it was also like the world's pain and the confusion and the sadness and all everything going on in this planet that breaks my heart too. And just gave it all in that little bowl. And I was bawling as this is happening and the group is coming around me and putting their hands on me. And oh, wow. so, yeah, it was pretty like huge, yeah. but um, I felt the seraphim there and, I, and Metatron was there. It was a, an archangel, which um, I've got like, metatron's cube like six seven eight different places in the stu yeah in the studio here uh -huh. i've just been drawn to that is that it that um, that's boy? one too yeah and that's that's a better one there yeah can you hold that up towards towards you this is it if you look at it a certain way but what is it so what is that so it basically is all the atomic structures in one uh -huh. but it's also like an archangel, um, an angel form. Yeah. So uh -huh. I've just, I don't know why I've been like drawn to that for the well, since like 2012. Okay. Uh, but I felt that symbol and that angel there with the seraphim. And then after I, I was done with the bull and the seed, yeah. the seraphim said it is finished. And it was kind of, oh yeah. And I remember a feeling of kind of like Lord of the Rings, like when the ghost army comes and they're, they think all hope is lost and, you know, they're doomed. And then all of a sudden Gandalf and like the ghost army and all the, the allies come and you just get that feeling of like, yes, we're going to win. Yeah. Like it's going to be okay. <laughs> that basically happened as I was packing it and giving God the seed that was like, everybody was there. Like I looked behind, it was like a thousand years of ancestors, Yeah, but I could kind of see their faces. I bet I just looked at them. I was like, whoa, wow. I just knew they were there. And our cats were there and my cat who had passed um, last year from the same cancer that I'm dealing with now, adenocarcinoma. Yeah. I was trying to save his life for the year before, um, but he was there the whole time with me yeah. through that too. So, but it was just this feeling of like all my family, all my friends, Marcy, our cats, 
everybody was just like pouring in and we were basically healing this cancer and that was as i was packing it so it was pretty cool it was like a very epic yeah. kind of but it was interesting as that you know i'm having this like totally inside journey but i'm also very aware of the room and very like almost sober too mm-hmm. if i opened my eyes i could just be in the room but, but then, it sounded like everybody in the room was aware of what you were going through also. yeah i mean because i by the end was bawling crying i was kneeling down on the ground yeah. basically dropping the seed as if i was bowing to god but i was bawling yeah there was people knew that something was going on so yeah. they came and um wow. gave me a lot of support that's wild a lot of like archetype type of stuff happening a lot of symbolism yeah did you talk about that with anybody or look into it further since then? Or like, what does it all mean? I think just, or... yeah, sharing with the group. And for me, it felt like that it is finished. Like this, the real healing. So like I'm healing everything on the 3D with chemo and all the different things. Mm-hmm. But this other level on a soul level happened on that weekend. Okay. And I think that was that it is finished is that I did what needed to be done. I see for that. Yeah. Yeah. That's amazing. I wonder why my experience wasn't like that, but it happened, you know, they say every night is different and yeah, even the third, you know, like, so yeah. Okay. So every journey, every night, every, yeah. Where even the, the type where it comes from too, like, I mean, mine mine was pretty incredible. I've already told you about my experience already and, and shared it with, like, social media. But uh, I don't have any regrets at all. But yours sounds really fun. <laughs> now, yeah, do you feel like you want to do it again? or I'll probably do it again, but maybe not for several years. Okay. Um, I actually joked with my guide that I'll come back to Peru someday and when I come back, I'll bring my wife. Nice. Which I don't have. Yeah. <laughs> Once I get one, I mean. Yeah. Um, but, uh, you know, um, he, he was saying like minimum six months or like maximum or like wait at least six months before you come back. Um, but I'll probably, you know, just wait until it feels right. Yeah. And listen to my tuition. I think... Um, that was that really put my tu- intuition into the forefront of my life like where it was like so subdued before right. it was so i never really thought to follow it or put any importance into following your intuition but um my intuition brought me there i um i've i've always thought about it but i never was in the right place mentally emotionally financially and I feel like I was in a place in my life where I had all these decisions to make. I I mentioned before, like my job is temporary. So I was like, what am I going to do with that? And trying to figure all these things out. And uh, my therapist just was saying like, you know, I was even thinking about going on antidepressants, to be honest. But um, honestly, one of the reasons why I was holding off is because I didn't want to go on antidepressants because if I did that, then I wouldn't be able to do ayahuasca, which I always wanted to do. So she was just like, just go do ayahuasca then. Yeah. <laughs> I'm like, yeah, why don't I? Like, I have the money and like, I could, I could take off of work and I'll be fine. Like, why don't I just go do it? And like, so I just kept, I just kept on for so long, just like making things complicated in my head and making excuses or just didn't have the confidence. Um. So, but I always had that intuition that I wanted to go and yeah. do it. So I finally followed it. And then, Surprisingly, my guide told me um, that intuition was probably one of my strongest Hmm. character traits, which I never even thought of before. Like, but he, for some reason, he felt that my intuition was strong. And I talked about this with my therapist as well. And she was like, yeah, your intuition is really good. Like, you should listen to it more. Your judgment is not so great, though. Like, what you do with it or the decision that you make around it, we can work on. But your intuition is very strong. And so now, um, yeah, I I kind of trying to be more sensitive, meditate every day, but also like try to listen to my intuition, like stop to think of like what the first thing that that pops into my mind yeah. is and not 
and uh, try, just like try to be more in the present moment and sensitive to the present moment and um you know i guess in in a simplistic way i'll just go with what, what the first thing that comes to mind yeah like when there's a decision to make large or small oh where are we going to dinner tonight you know let's go to this this direction you know and this like this pops into my head like this idea and like yeah. let's go this way you know and That's so awesome. i just trying to like follow my intuition in that way lately i guess that's awesome and it's it's been like pretty good you know life has been good um i feel like you i feel so much lighter um i met a girl hopefully things will go well we'll see but pretty happy so far um i'm doing this interview like i feel like i'm living life to the fullest yeah you know this past week we talked about uh it was a little weird like energy wise, yeah. like I felt tired and, and, um, you know, not a hundred percent. I've been like on my phone a lot lately, but, uh, you know, it's all good. You know, it goes in waves. Like sometimes I'm present, sometimes it's, I'm struggling, but, uh, I still feel grounded. I still feel happy. I still feel strong and emotionally powerful, you know, and I don't feel like there's anything more that I could do with my days. That's awesome. Yeah. You know, like. I'm living every day to the best of my ability. And uh, I'm just like really happy and excited to see like what's going to happen. So cool. That's yeah. a sweet spot to be in. Yeah. It's it's really amazing. But anyways, let's. Uh, I want to hear about your third third ceremony. Yeah, right? There was the, a third one, right? Yeah, there was a third night, yeah. Okay. So what was that like? Um, the third night was wild. It was... So there was the storm, the hurricane or whatever that was supposed to be coming through. Yeah. So it was pretty chaotic outside and like, you know, crazy rain, crazy wind and mm -hmm. things being blown over. And um, I think it added to like the wildness of the room. That was, that night was like almost incomprehensible. Like the, just the state people were in, I could see the energy flying around and just like, boom, like just blasting people. Like, I don't know what was happening, but there was something <laughs> going around and just like somebody would throw up and it would fly around and knock someone else and they'd be crying. And yeah, so it felt like there was a big presence in the room yeah. and the energy felt more wild. Like it felt like people were more like animal-like or there was like a lot of, like I was making weird sounds that just felt natural and like weird little clicking sounds i have no idea why and like someone else next to me was also yeah to kind of play it to this like energy in the room this animal energy so it was weird it was kind of like um it wasn't peaceful and ecstatic like the second night but it wasn't terrible or wasn't bad per se but it was just intense yeah and there were times where I was like, oh man, is this going to freak me out? Am I going to, is this yeah. now going to get too much? Like, cause I started to feel it like build up in my body. Um, but I just like would sit cross-legged and just like straight, you know, straighten my spine as much as possible and just warrior breath and just like yeah. imagine myself like with stabs kind of hitting the ground. So like whatever energy was there that could have been intense or scary Mm -hmm. just like breathe and just be strong and just let it know that it's just doing its work. You know, it, it's not bad. It's not nice per se, or like, you know, like easygoing either, but yeah, yeah, it was definitely different. I was like, okay. Like it for a second was like, Oh man, can I do this again? Yeah. Cause it felt like it was hitting that peak intensity. Well, I mean, but... plus you just went through like these crazy two nights before yeah. too, you know, like, that's exhausting. Like my, I, I also did a three ceremony thing and yeah, my third one, I just felt totally exhausted. Yeah. And I didn't sleep the first two nights, like, you know, six, seven in the morning. And then I'm still talking to people just like, so yeah. moved by everything. So I slept maybe an hour or two during the day. Wow. And I just ate so much food. I was just like, so hungry. Was there a lot of food there? We just like, we brought like, there was different breads and it's funny cause I'm like eating keto yeah you know like normally but that yeah what was that the diet was like? not keto at all. <laughs> it was yeah. just like breads and fruit uh -huh. and you know you brought your own and, food right yeah and uh, the makosis cooked really delicious soups or just like different oh, chicken and so oh, yeah right. so it was okay. kind of like a group 
um, contribution and stuff of like nuts and yeah, just I see. snack stuff. But I just couldn't stop eating. Like I was just like wanted food. But, but no meat, right? Uh, just a little chicken, but no, yeah, no red meat or... Oh, they let you eat meat there. Yeah, they just a little bit, yeah. Okay, interesting. I think it's more um, the red meat that they were like... But even there was coffee too, and they're like coffee's supposed to be one of the things you you don't do. Yes, yeah, stimulants. Um, and I never stopped coffee. Okay. It. I stopped everything else. I stopped cannabis. Um, I did the dieta, and I stopped like the medication. But coffee, I just lowered to one cup because I was like, "There's just no way." I love coffee too much. But even in the morning of the ceremony, yeah. I would have like two cups of coffee. So well, I. Um... <laughs> I mean, I love coffee too, but my guide said to stay away from stimulants also. And um, yeah, it's definitely recommended. Yeah. And it might interfere with the metabolism of it. So, like, I did feel like it took till a lot later in the night to get into the like uh, okay. upside down Z land, you know? Yeah. So, whether that's coffee or whatever, like, yeah, but no. I could see if you're too stimulated, like the energy of I w- would be like, whoa. You well, know? I mean, even now, like I've been, that was in July. Right now it's September. I still feel like buzzy, like high, like I'm operating like with high vibrations. Yeah. Uh, but when I drink coffee, I'm just more sensitive and um, I feel like my vibrations get lower. Yeah. Like I get a little numb. Wow. Yeah. So well, it's cool I, that you're you got to tune to what yeah but I, I still enjoy it and I still get I have days where I lose sleep and I get really tired so I'll drink like maybe once or twice a week yeah um it actually really helps with my digestion actually yeah that's the part so like whenever I want to like <laughs> clean out my colon or I need to go I'll drink some coffee too that's cool yeah, yeah. <laughs> so it's superpower is <laughs> yeah Wow. So did you speak to any of the other cancer patients about their experience? Like what, how was their experience? So yeah, there was one girl who just kind of was there for the first night and she she seemed like she had a, yeah, rough night or a weird night or something. Yeah. Um, and then our friend who is a cancer survivor. Yeah. She had a very, she was there for just two nights. Yeah. She had a really profound, intense couple of nights too. Uh huh. But she was up there with me while I was on trial on the what? first night. And oh, she yeah. was like linked arms, like all three of the cancer yeah. people were linked up. Um, I don't think that's a coincidence that like it became like this fight. Yeah, like, that's this cancer it. fight yeah, with, with all kinda, these other people, you know. Um, I was like, well, this is all for a reason for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so the third night was over and then that was it? Yeah, that was it. We just headed home on Monday and Okay. Yeah. And Marcy, how how was Marcy? It was good. She had a little bit like I think I would had the, you know, a static like whoa after the first time that she had experienced. Um I think she had a like a little bit harder yeah. integration this time. And mm-hmm. just knowing what she was dealing with with family. Have you felt like friends have changed or support or, you know, um, yeah, can you talk about, like, talk about that? Yeah, I think, well, it's been interesting to see, there hasn't been too much change, but it's been really cool to see the friends who really have come out yeah. or are always checking in and the friends that I've actually I haven't heard anything from. It's like, oh, that's interesting. But yeah. um, I think everybody just has, like, a different like some people get freaked out by it, which I understand too. Yeah. Or they don't know what to do or say. Yeah. Um, but then we've had friends like go over the mountain, over the top with, for, you know, love and just like, yeah, just to get to really know like how honored I am to be considered a friend of yeah. that person. Is yeah, I know really one cool. of your friends like set up a GoFundMe, GoFundMe page for yeah. you. Which I think is still alive and going yeah. on, so we'll sh- we'll be sure to share that. Yeah, and that's been like because I haven't been able to work. Yeah. So yeah, I mean the music stuff is most everything is hey can we have that tomorrow? Yeah. Or the next day, I was like, well, I'm in chemo tomorrow and the next day, so right. um, I haven't been able. To, I've had a little bit of video game stuff, but it's just a little you know, very small amount. So yeah. So 
Well, I want to talk about two things. I want to talk about like, how are you making it work now financially? And then I also want to talk about like some music stuff. Yeah. But I guess let's, let's just talk about like the financial stuff too. So how are you making it work? Well, yeah, it's been kind of like a miracle situation because um, with the give, send, go, like we've had so many of our friends and like different people that I've worked for too, just like huge, yeah, really generous donations. Yeah. So like our mortgage has been taken care of so I can, I'm paying for treatments every week. So the treatments are okay, pretty expensive. <laughs> so yeah. um, I've been just going off my savings, but then I met somebody at the cancer center who has been helping me and a few other people there do mm. different stock stuff. So like each week, um, like I put some money into that, that's been helping pay for treatments and stuff. So I'm not like just totally dwindling my savings down to nothing. Like yeah. I'm on at least doing that game enough to pay for stuff. Sure. So I'm not going into the, yeah. yeah. Also something that I'm sure it hasn't, it, it does, has, it's not by coincidence. Yeah. It felt, you know, it's been like um, that you found this resource or found this lifeline. If it's like this whole cancer experience has been like walking off the cliff and each step of the way, like I don't know exactly how or what's going to happen or what, what we need to do, but then boom, like the step appears yeah. and I keep walking and a step keeps appearing. And like, you still wonder like, Oh, are there going to continue to be steps? But like I've now gone so far off the cliff, I look back and there's just like a huge row of steps, but steps like that, that are like, how am I going to make this work financially? Cause I thought I was going to be doing a lot less chemos too. Like in the yeah. beginning it was like, okay, I'm going to be doing, you know, 16 to 24. And now I'm at 33 and there's like no end in sight, you know, or yeah. there, you know, it could be another 33 chemo. So I am very fortunate that the finance you know, like with this guy, like everything just clicked. Yeah. Um, to where I can now sustain treatments, not have to sell our house, not have to totally, you know, like <laughs> it's, a, it's a miracle. Like it's all kind of like yeah, every step of the way things have been clicking. So, so yeah, it's like you know, you're not doing this traditional path. You have four different doctors and have gone through many others. It sounds like so. Yeah, it can't be cheap. Um. Like, are you paying out of pocket or is like insurance helping you? Um, insurance takes care of some stuff. So like some of the, like the chemo pill and like one of the chemo treatments is covered by insurance. Mm -hmm. But then my weekly like vitamin C and my IPT chemo, I pay out of pocket mm -hmm. um, every week. And then like the targeted therapies insurance and like CT scans are insurance. So their insurance does a good amount, but then it's still, yeah, like more than our mortgage every week yeah. <laughs> at the cancer center. Yeah. But I mean, you certainly are very fortunate and, and, um, I don't know how I should say, like in a way spiritually guided by having these resources pop up when you need them. Yeah. You know, but I think most people probably aren't so lucky. Um, so like, for example, if you didn't have this guy, if you didn't end up meeting this guy, if you didn't have this financial lifeline, like everything would change, would have to change. Right. Yeah. It would probably, it would just be pivoting decisions, like mm -hmm. not doing as much, as much stuff, mm -hmm. um, and just relying on just some of the therapies instead of doing like everything just to give it the best shot. Mm -hmm. So like. Like even the chemo stuff that I'm doing, the IPT, it's like, well, it's not going to cure anything, but it is making sure it's putting pressure on. It's just another thing. Mm -hmm. So it's better to do it than to not do it. Yeah. Um, but yeah, like it would be just different decisions. Mm -hmm. And it would have been probably different decisions all along if I didn't have some savings that I knew. I was like, okay, well, we can, you know, and there's people that sell their houses. Yeah. To me, that's been... It's an option. Oh, yeah. It's like you hit layers of, yeah. it's like, got to do what you got to do. So yeah. I had accepted losing all of my savings at retirement or whatever. Because it's like, well, there's no retirement if I'm not around. Yeah. Um, and I think once I had accepted that, that I would just, okay, just 
go back to having nothing or being broke. Like back when I very first started doing music, that's how where I was. Yeah. So it's like I'll just do that because I I've made it this far. Like I'll figure it out, you know. Yeah. Um, but thankfully, I haven't had to do that yet. But then there's stuff like the Mexico, the Williams Institute, like that would be yeah that would be like getting a HELOC or selling the house or something if oh, I'm really? gonna do those treatments I'm yeah. not eligible for those treatments now okay either because um they're actually what's in my lungs are too small I see so um but yeah there's like well that's a good thing I guess yeah it's a good thing yeah, yeah. so he's like oh you just got some pesky lung nodules I'm like <laughs> okay that's one way of putting it but but like um his treatments yeah like yeah. $35,000 times three to 12, you know, like, wow. say you are talking about selling the house or getting, yeah, like crazy credit cards. Like people do, people find different ways to do it. And people have done gifts and goes that are going at the cancer center or they're doing um, their life insurance or yeah. uh, credit cards. Like, I think one thing that we talked about was, um, you know, a lot of maybe old school doctors will be stuck in one kind of mindset and say you have x amount of time to live when they aren't up to the information that's out there like there's all these other things that you can try you know so are there any resources like that that you like can point people to yes so yeah there are i'm trying to think off the top of my head um because i've actually been collecting this like master email of links and various things on various topics too so like mm -hmm. um anything from keto to ice bath to different teas to why do you certain supplements to repurpose drugs um there's not a great one stop shop for everything which is i'm actually trying to make that website myself as far as so like a cancer patient that mm -hmm. is newly diagnosed doesn't know anything about all this could get at least be exposed to what other options are out there as far as like, oh, maybe if you ask your oncologist about this or make sure you're getting the gene mutation looked at so you can look at immunotherapy or um, hyperthermia or these different things because it's definitely a learning process and I think you just have to spend a lot of time researching. Mm -hmm. um, there's a lot of independent like websites of people like Chris Beats Cancer um, that have communities of people that are beating cancer naturally uh, or using a hybrid kind of approach like I'm doing. Um, yeah, I think there needs to be more. There probably are a few websites I don't know about. There's mm -hmm. a lot of smaller like other survivors um, like that I've saved all these websites Sure. that I said. So like a friend of a friend of ours just was diagnosed. So said, hey, can she reach out to you? So I got on the phone with her and talked to her for like an hour and then I emailed her like, probably way too many things. But yeah. um, until I get it on a website, yeah, that's kind of like the only way that I know how to share all this stuff because it's just a collection of the things I've learned from my team, but also like a bunch of us at the Cancer Center are just sitting there researching all day yeah, and uh, finding, you know, like, oh, did you hear about this thing or this, just always sending information or a study, you know, even just from the supplement angle. Mm -hmm. um, so, um, yeah, hopefully people will see this. Hopefully it comes out okay <laughs> in the end. Uh, and all the technical difficulties will work itself out. Uh, but, and if people do see this, you know, hopefully we can point them in the right direction and we'll have some resources yeah. available to them if, if they need them. Um, and I like, yeah, I like just to make myself available, you know, some people like, it's interesting if you give them information, they may be too much or may not resonate or they're, you know, yeah. what they do with it is up to them. And I don't know, like, sure. I know there's a million things that I'm doing that won't appeal to other people, but just knowing like, hey, check out these books, like How to Starve Cancer. That's a great book. Yeah. Like that should be required reading for all cancer patients just to start thinking differently about things. Mm -hmm. um, there's just a lot of things to plug into that at least gets you going on the path to 
finding what works for you. And some people just want to do, just not think about it and just go through like whatever conventional thing. And that's fine too. Like there's, there's no right way to do it, but I think definitely everybody, like we're talking about intuition, that's, this is a good time to get that skill mustered up because like doctors aren't right hundred percent of the time. And there are other there's a lot out there available as far as options and things to integrate into things and the spiritual practices and like dealing with emotions and like all this stuff. It's a, it's a lot going on. And when you first are diagnosed, you're not really thinking about it's hard to handle all that information. But as you're going through the process, pretty much most of the time I see cancer patients get very activated mm -hmm. and the amount of people at where I'm going that are, reading all the books, watching all the documentaries, changing their diet, changing their lifestyle, looking at every possible solution, you know, that they can do plus treatment wise. It's pretty incredible to see people just yeah. really fire up and want to inform themselves. And like I was saying earlier about the CEO thing, like ultimately we're relying on, you know, whatever medication or whatever doctor, but, really at the end of the day like you have to be responsible and you have to be involved just as much you have to be your own doctor with them even though you'll never have their 10 years or 12 years of schooling mm -hmm. like at least make the effort to know what's going on and to ask questions and there's been times where like people you know like oh good thing i got that second opinion because it wasn't what they said you know like that's happened a million times yeah and like even um you know, the surgeon who wants to cut out your colon versus the immunotherapy guy who says, oh, well, your entire immune system is your colon. So I would say do immunotherapy, like getting to know those differences in opinions, because mm -hmm. each doctor or industry is going to be quick to sell you like their thing. Like the radiologist guy is like, oh, well, I'll burn it out. And the surgeon will cut it out. And the chemo <laughs> guy will nuke it out. And they all want to do their thing. And yeah. they all think that their thing is the best. Typically, like not to, yeah, yeah, overgeneralize with all this stuff, but typically that's the thing, you know, is like they're what they specialize in is, is going to be the best thing. Yeah. But is that the best thing or do you want the permanent effects of radio, you know, radiation if you can exhaust other options first? So mm -hmm. those are the things where the individual's knowledge, um, research and intuition, I think play a huge role in like what you decide to do and not do yeah um so your music career has been pretty much on hold but you still have some other music projects going on but um in terms of like the music industry well i guess it's a little bit of coincidental timing are you affected at all or were you affected by the writer's strike um i would have been yeah this time around, yeah, because the I was on a couple shows. Yeah. Um, that yeah, I don't think they're. I don't yeah. Know when they'll be back, but yeah, they're everything's on pause. But the video game stuff is not affected. It's so. not affected. Okay. And you're still working with them a little bit, but not very much. Yeah, there's just not a ton of, for this one company, a ton of work. So. Okay. Um, but we just do every quarter like an anime and then at the end of the year there's a, a bigger chunk but it's been kind of perfect because i only have like a day a week and then some days there's no day like yeah um but i have been writing my own music like i have a piano album mm -hmm. of about 12 songs that i have in motion i've been playing at the cancer center for people which has been cool yeah it's kind of like writing them partly there and partly here um but just writing for my own you know, like not even thinking of it as like a, yeah, music career is like a funny, like, oh yeah, forgot about that whole thing. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, I was just wondering how like your contacts in the music industry have been reacting to your cancer or, I mean, this is probably like a stupid question in a way, but um, I mean, there's like no health insurance or anything. You're like freelance right yeah and then so like these it's not like a regular job where you could take time off and it'll be there when you get back yeah basically i've 
like I don't even know if I'll have a career. I don't know if I, you know, like I'm yeah. kind of just not worrying about it. But I know enough people, and I think there's work out there. It's just I just need the time to be able to do the work because everything, you know, like the shows. Yeah, there was no way to do like that schedule was like a immovable. Yeah. Like you give your life to that schedule. Yeah. Um, there wasn't like, oh, sorry, I can't. I'm not available today, or like I have treatment today. There's like that just wouldn't jive. So, um, and that's actually most of the work for music stuff. Like even the trailers were like, okay, well, we need this thing tomorrow. So, um, I just kind of yeah, just figure it. I'll figure it out after, and I'm okay actually with the liberation that like right now getting to write or work with um, friends, musicians that like, I was always too busy composing and just so focused on the composing career. Yeah. That actually it's really, it's been pretty liberating to just be making music yeah. that I love or with people I love and um, would yeah. like to do more of that. That's so funny. I'm like in a similar journey in that, but I haven't achieved like the success that you have but I was trying to, um, but I was just miserable doing it and wasn't, and by being that miserable, wasn't really doing a good job of it. But I realized that from my ayahuasca retreat, that was never something that I wanted to do in the first place, honestly. Yeah. Where sometimes we chase these dreams that aren't even. Yeah. So, but now, soul really, yeah. Exactly. but now I'm in a place where I'm just doing it for fun. I'm just enjoying playing guitar like I used to back in the old days. Yeah. Um, just kind of like how you're exploring with your friends that you never had the opportunity to do before because you were too busy. Yeah, and I am way more in love with music right now than I was a year ago too when I was spending more time in here. You know, it was kind of like this churning out the same kind of stuff all the time and I just like, I didn't listen to music ever. Yeah. And now, like, on because I'm driving so much Irvine, I'm listening to a lot of music and yeah. just, like, in love with playing music again. And it's just, it's nice. It's weird if you break the the demand of a career and, like, all the, the deadlines and the hustle of it and just to return back to, like, why we do, yeah, why we got into it from the first place. <laughs> do you think you'll go back to that? Um, I don't know. I'm hoping not. I think, so Marcy and I kind of have dreams of starting like you know one day down the road like even moving to tennessee or doing some kind of like um studio thing together where like because she's an amazing producer and she's more like a rick rubin she's like a totally different side of the brain and then i'm in here you know on the, the technical, technical side, side yeah. and like i think together it'd be really fun and she knows all the artists and i think just us producing together um it's kind of like our future dream but like making it a cool like barn studio like with yurts or some kind of thing where <laughs> people want to come like stay yeah. a few weeks with us and make an album um and then hopefully you know like i still do have film things that like you know there's a couple films that like i scored in the last 10 years that are still in the works of being made and like if they pop you know, I kind of feel like in my intuition that those are still in the future pipeline. Mm -hmm. um, and also this divine timing thing. It's like the universe isn't going to give me all the over like, you know, overextending opportunities right now because that's just not the right time right now. Like I'm supposed to be doing all this other stuff and it's obviously allowing me to do all that so yeah. I can build the website and have you know these kind of conversations or help people because that's the work right now. And as that all evolves, you know, the, the next right thing will click. So I'm just kind of like, I've given up my will, like imposing my will. Yeah. <laughs> so I'm just like, I'm here to serve, like whatever you want. Like I have, you know, yeah, I can offer something to something. So like, just like taking my ego out of it. I was definitely like getting way too sucked into like, I have to have this, composing career i gotta be scoring this thing or i need this agent or all these things and mm -hmm. it's kind of nice to just be like well none of that matters now yeah and maybe it will again maybe it won't but i i definitely would like to keep my heart and soul alive in music and if it's producing stuff in 
Tennessee <laughs> with Marcy or if it's whatever, you know, or just doing nutrition or something. Yeah. I have no idea. Yeah. What's like the most, what's, what piece of music have you written that you're the most proud of? Like ever or? Yeah. I don't know. That's a good question. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's weird with, I think I've gotten used to just letting everything go as I'm. Yeah. I'm it's like, it. yeah, exactly. Like yeah. in that world, in the music industry, especially at your level, um, you're just kind of like a factory. Yeah. It's you know, on to you the just, next thing. And you're not really, or maybe you're, you, well, you don't have time to bask or maybe you're not that connected or maybe you just developed the skills where you could just turn it out, you know, but but was there ever a piece of music that really, really meant something to you that you're really proud of? There's been moments. Yeah. There's been things where I was like, Oh, that's kind of like this thing that I really like had a vision for that almost hits there. But I feel like I haven't, I'm not really overall happy with how hmm. my overarching thing, like I I'm happy with the success. Um, but like, if I look at like my music on Spotify, I'm not like, stoked about it because hmm. it's it is you know like scoring for films and games and these things it is kind of disposable because you know it's this one thing and then it's over and then it's moving on to the next and um, there isn't the time to make like a lasting cool thing and then some of my albums i've made like there's like some cool you know my own album stuff some cool things but i haven't really explored it enough so i'm actually right now i feel like the happiest which is probably every musician is right now the happiest with what they're doing but Mm -hmm. the stuff i'm doing on the piano and some of the like synth ambient piano string stuff is actually stuff that i would want to listen to yeah where like a lot of my stuff on spotify like i don't want to listen to any of that like that was serving a purpose and like you know um, facilitating a trailer or a game or whatever but like i don't actually want to listen to that so (laughs) which is interesting because like thousands or millions of people listen to it yeah (laughs) i'm like listening to it yeah Yeah, which is cool and i'm like i'm glad so but i'm just now creating the music that i would want to listen to yeah yeah And, and actually proud of the musicality of it like i just finished one song on piano where even just recording it and i'm not greatest piano player i'm like a little bit newer to the instrument but i've been playing it a lot and playing those songs a lot like which reminded me of the old days of being in band practice and like just drilling Mm -hmm. the same song for like a year you know every night and watching it evolve as you practice and like being you know having the instrument involved instead of just sitting at the computer so tracking it on piano and playing it one time all the way through no editing and not to a click and like having it be nice and live and loose and just like real Mm -hmm. and human. Like that's the first time I've really been able to pull that off. So that was like an achievement for me. And I feel the emotion, like when, um, you know, we had a friend over before ceremony and I played it for her and both of us were crying by the end. Oh, She was bawling. So like that to me is, that's a success. Like all the, you know, placement or having association with a game or a film is cool and it's exciting and it was really exciting, but also it's a sugar burn thing because it's like, you know, it's cool for a second and then it's on to the next and, you know, pretty mm-hmm. soon that thing is old news. And so it's a weird thing to hang your hat on as far as what you're proud of. Yeah. Um, because it's like quicksand a little bit. Mm-hmm. But yeah, having a song that I could play for someone that they cry or, you know, even just playing at the cancer center, like when I play all of a sudden the room is like totally different and then people come up after. And so that that's a different yeah. kind of like, that's a bit more meaningful to me lately. So I would like to pursue that more and yeah. really like go just, you know, full, no restraints of just like, making music for music's sake yeah without worrying about money and placements and like what this should be or the branding and all the silly things i like get in the way of just like childlike creation or just intuitive like it's because all this stuff is like an emotional journal for me too like i'm like playing i'm not thinking about it i'm playing the first like the intuition thing again Mm -hmm. i'm playing the first thing that comes out i'm not thinking at all and whatever comes like that's the that's the piece there it is so but it is an emotional journal of like 
this journey and this time right now. Um, yeah, I hope I get to see um, your cancer center. We talked about like yeah. me photographing some yeah. stuff over there, so that would be really cool. Maybe cross my cross my fingers. Maybe I can meet some people over there. Um, and then also looking forward to seeing how these songs come out whenever you're ready to share them or release them. Yeah. And then um, I think it'd be cool to follow up with you. I'm not sure in what format, whether it'd be photos or maybe another interview or maybe interviews with other people around you with Marcy um, down the line. That'd be awesome. Uh, maybe periodically, like as you get the results from your next uh, scan. Yeah. Or maybe two scans from now, or whatever. We'll figure it Do out. Do like some check in, yeah. Things, that updates. Um, I think that'd be really cool. That would be really cool. And we can even do like. And I'll have the camera set up if we do this again, and we'll be ready. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> you know, hopefully we won't have any technical difficulties the second time around, or the third, and so on. Um. Yeah. Cool. Do you have anything else that you want to talk about? I think. Um, I think uh, it's getting yeah, enough to chew on. Yeah, yeah, it's bit, it's uh, uh, <laughs> it's been quite the talk, and um, I'm not gonna lie, I feel a little tired. <laughs> it is all exhausting too. Yeah, <laughs> but um, but it was great. This is great, and I, I really enjoyed it. I hope you enjoyed it. Yes. Yeah. Thank you. And um, yeah, we'll uh, we'll put it all together and put, share it with the world. I don't know how. I'm, I don't really have a following or anything. I was thinking maybe just put it on your YouTube channel or yeah. something, to be honest. Yeah, I'll share it on uh, <laughs> Instagram something. and YouTube and, yeah. and also on the... Uh, so it's my healthy cell journey is the website. Yeah. So it'll just be... And people are like, why aren't... Like, Marcy's always like, why don't you have this done now? I'm like, I'm literally saving all this stuff, but I'm like, there's the turning point where all of a sudden two weeks of me just banging this thing out of everything I've collected. Yeah. Devices to therapies, to doctors, to, okay, you know, info studies, the whole thing. And also just the experience. Yeah. Sharing and just doing videos. So like putting this video. Yeah. yeah be Great. Huge. Um, so my healthy cell journey is the name, my healthy cell journey dot com. I believe so. I'll have to look at that. Or whatever. That's a, I bought the domain already. But okay, yeah. we'll, we'll figure it out. So. But the website is in the works, so we'll check back in when that's ready to go to. And um, yeah, man, I, you know, have good feelings like things are going to work out. You know, like you were just as bad in your first go around with cancer, I think. I think worse, yeah. Worse. Yeah. So. It was just. This one's just trickier. Yeah. But it's not as bad as far as. Right. Yeah. And you seem to be handling it well and you got the resources. And um, yeah, I just, I just really hope that it, it all works out. Thank you. Yeah. I love my life way too much. Like, I, it's crazy just waking up or like I hike a lot or run at the trails and I'll just get up and I'll just feel the air look at the light, the trees, and just, like, get this overwhelming feeling of, like, I don't want to leave. Like, I love this. I love life. I love Earth. Like, how cool yeah. this planet is. Like, who knows, you know, what other planets were born on on all our lifetimes, if, you know, if that whole thing is real. Yeah. And I just absolutely love life. And we'll do, like, I'll hike the Himalayas. I'll sit in an ice bath for 30 days. I'll do whatever I need to do Yeah. to get this thing handled. <laughs> All right, brother. Well, let's call it a night. Cool. And uh, yeah, thank you so much. Yeah, thank you. Yeah. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Good. <laughs>